Thank you so much for being with us tonight. If we haven't met before, my name is Dr. Kate Jibo, and I'm the director of the Cohen Institute for Holocaust and Genocide Studies here at Keene State College. Um, and we want to begin tonight with a land acknowledgement. So the Cohen Institute wishes to acknowledge that Keene State College is located on the traditional ancestral homeland of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. We note that some of these peoples lack federal recognition and that this land remains unceded. We acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land, the waterways, and the people who have stewarded them throughout the generations. Tonight's talk is entitled Native People in the Monadnock Region, Unearthing 13,000 Years. 13,000, I had to double check that. That number yep. seemed too big. That's a big number. Oh. Welcome, grab a seat, thank you. Um, 13,000 years of history, survival, and endurance. And we're pleased to be hosting, hosting Professor Robert Goodby as our featured guest. So before we begin, please just remember to silence your phones and any other devices that you might have with you. I just had to do that myself a minute ago. And please also know that this presentation is being recorded. Um, so for tonight, um, Bob is going to speak for a little while and share his presentation with all of us. And then if there's time permitting, he said he's also willing to take some questions from our audience. So we will wrap up at 630 and we'll just make the most of our time during that hour together. And this presentation tonight is being held in recognition of Indigenous Peoples Day, and it's also part of a year-long series on forensics and genocide that is being offered by the Cohen Institute. So tonight, we have the opportunity to learn what archaeological evidence can teach us about the history and experiences of the Western Abenaki over time. We'll also come to see how local histories that minimized or denied the existence of the Abenaki in the Monadnock region have been debunked in certain ways. And our guest this evening, Bob Goodby, is a professor of anthropology at Franklin Pierce University in Ringe. He holds a PhD in anthropology from Brown University and has spent more than 30 years studying Native American archaeological sites in New England. He is past president of the New Hampshire Archaeological Society, a former trustee of the Mount Kearsage Indian Museum in Warner, and he served on the New Hampshire Commission on Native American Affairs. In 2010, he directed the excavations of four 12,000-year-old Paleo-Indian dwellings at the Tenant Swamp site in Keene. And more recently, his book, A Deep Presence, was published in 2021 by Peter E. Randall Publisher. So we're honored to have you with us tonight, Bob, and I'm going to turn the podium over to you for your okay. presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, uh, uh, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Do I sound okay in the back row? And okay, I, I'm hoping I sound okay out on Zoom as well. So uh, thank you very much for coming. I've been looking forward to doing this talk for a long time. Uh, well, since I was invited to do it, at least. So my name is Bob Goodby. I'm an archaeologist. And this year marks 40 years since I fell in love with this weird business when I was an undergraduate at the University of New Hampshire. And I, I've been thinking about that a lot. I have done all of my archaeological research in New England and the vast majority of that in New Hampshire. And for the last 25 years since joining the faculty of Franklin Pierce, I have focused my work uh, right here in the Monadnock region. And so what I want to do tonight is talk to you about that work and what I have learned about Native people, not only as an archaeologist, but also as, as a, someone who tries to be a critical reader of history and somebody who has tried for many years to uh, work with Native communities today. Uh, and I'm going to bring uh, all of that into the mix tonight. So my big challenge in putting this talk together was so many things I wanted to talk about. And right up to the last minute, it's like, i got to throw that out, throw that out. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get right to it. So this is not a topic that people know a lot about. A lot of people who are born in this region, grow up here, uh, can find themselves uh, retirement age knowing little or nothing about the Native people who are here. But if you were curious about it, where would you begin? Yeah, it's the history, the human history of the Monadnock region. You might begin right across the street here. 
You might go to the Historical Society of Cheshire County and say, okay, I'm going to start with the town histories. They must say something about the Native Americans. And indeed they do. So if you pull off the, the standard history, uh, Simon Griffin's History of Keene, published 120 years ago, like most local town histories, he deals with the Indians right up at the front of his book. And he deals with them pretty decisively. And you can, you can read the paragraph for yourself. But he's basically saying that, yeah, OK, there were some native people here, but not really. They, they just kind of wandered through on their way to somewhere else. There was not a significant or uh, permanent presence for many years, but few Indians lived in the immediate vicinity. Okay? So an empty land, which is really handy if it's your plan to come here, take the land, and live. Uh, to, to declare it empty. But we have a real ambivalence about this history. Because while on the one hand we have this book, so you, you've read this in the historical society and you decide to stretch your legs, you walk out the door and walk down the sidewalk and right across the street from where we are tonight. I don't know if you've seen this, there's a boulder right next to the sidewalk. And on the boulder is a plaque put there by the Daughters of the American Revolution in the 1930s. It's a little hard to read on the screen, so I'll, I'll read it for you. It says, this boulder marks the site of the old fort built in 1738 by the early settlers of Upper Ashwillet, which was the original name for Keene, as a refuge from the Indians who didn't live here. <laughs> okay? Right across the street. Uh, the first English settlers here had to build a walled fort to protect themselves from the indigenous inhabitants who didn't want them here. So the boulder is telling you native people were central to this history, but the official town history says they were peripheral. So what is the truth? And the archaeology can help us get to that. Now, first of all, where are we? Okay, we had the, the nice land acknowledgement statement uh, at the beginning here. And we are in the southern part of the traditional homeland of the uh, Western Abenaki people. But one of the things I've, I've come to think about is what exactly that means and, and how do we think of these people? How has that identity been uh, created and, and put forth? And most people uh, think of Indian tribes very much the way we think of nations. Tribes have bounded territories. Uh, so you always know whose territory you're in and, and where it begins. And a, a great example of this, this is from the Handbook of North American Indians published by the Smithsonian in 1978. And it, it's, it's wonderfully neat and clean. It shows you the tribal territory of all the major groups in the Northeast. And so there we have the, uh, the Western Abenaki. And you can see where they are and where they leave off. It's a world with nice boundaries, kind of like the ones that separate New Hampshire from Vermont. And it is also a complete fiction. The native people here did not think of themselves in those sorts of terms. The idea that this line here up in the area around Conway, New Hampshire, Freiburg, Maine, that that somehow separated Western Abenaki people from Eastern Abenaki people. They weren't different people. They spoke mutually intelligible dialects. They were related to each other. They intermarried. That boundary would have been meaningless to them. But this is the way we organize the world. Uh, um, another way, this is a map created by a scholar with some uh, Abenaki ancestry. And this is the same thing, a little bit more uh, close up. Okay? We're focusing really on New Hampshire and Vermont here. Now, when you're first looking at this map, it, it might be a little puzzling. Uh, do you see where we are? So one of the problems here is, is the map has done away with the European convention of being oriented to the north. Okay? It's tilted, and so that makes it a little harder to see the geography. But it's also a map that doesn't have lines separating people. Uh, and to, to help sort of orient you, that's Mount Monadnock right there. Okay? Um, so uh, here is the Merrimack River, there's the Connecticut River, uh, the Gulf of Maine, and that is your orientation. This is a very different way to think about the land and the, uh, the cultural landscape. Uh, um, we are in Indakina, uh, the traditional homeland of uh, the Western Abenaki, but not a homeland that was 
uh, separated from other native people. Uh, one of my colleagues, Lisa Brooks, a historian, uh, discovered that during King Philip's War in 1675-76, when the Narragansett down in Rhode Island were being hammered by the English, you know where they came to seek refuge? They came here. They came to the Keene area because they knew the people here. They were their relatives. They knew they would take them in. That was the nature of the native landscape. Now the history is invisible. Some of the invisibility is because of the archeology span and some of the invisibility is because it's been made that way. So a few things that uh, contribute to that. One is almost all of our sites are underground. So you drive by them, walk over them, live your whole life not knowing that they're right below uh, the surface. I was just speaking with someone before the talk who, uh, uh, who spent many years teaching right where the Paleo-Indian site is in Keene, having no idea that it was only this far beneath the surface. This is one of the rare exceptions in the region, a, a rock carving or petroglyph site up in Bellows Falls, where if you know where to go and where to look, you can see that and you can say, yes, okay, that's an artifact, somebody made that. Um, we have no idea how old it is. We, we do know the first European settlers here saw it and called them the old Indian carvings, but that is about as visible as our sites get. So that is part of the problem. Part of the problem is preservation. Right? Our soil here is, from an archaeological standpoint, lousy. <laughs> and it's, the reason for that is it's very acidic. Right? So organic things tend to decay very quickly. And uh, much of the material culture that the Abenaki and their ancestors would have had would be made of things like leather and bark and porcupine quills. And the Abenaki are particularly noted for making beautiful baskets out of ash splints. But none of these are going to survive for more than a decade or so in our soil. So if you're looking for them archaeologically, you're not going to see them. It's, it's the equivalent of trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle that you know is supposed to have 500 pieces. But when you start to put it together, you find you only have 45 pieces, and half of those are broken. Uh, so it is a real challenge because so much is missing. It, it adds to that invisibility. Um, another part of the problem, uh, if you go out to Arizona and New Mexico, you can see uh, uh, cliff dwellings, pueblos from hundreds or maybe even more than 1,000 years ago permanent enduring structures that show you that, that people were there. Those people were sedentary agricultural people. But in this region, for almost all their history, the Abenaki were what anthropologists call hunters and gatherers. They lived in small communities, and they would move from season to season. They were not nomadic. They didn't wander aimlessly. But they would follow the same seasonal routes, going to where resources were available, at fishing locations in the spring, at hunting sites in the fall, where they'd be in the forest hunting deer and collecting acorns. And so all of their structures were, were meant to be temporary. So they might be wigwams or, or small longhouses built on frames of wooden poles. And again, ask yourself, what is going to be visible after the passage of 100 years? Nothing but maybe the stains in the soil that, that only an archaeologist would be able to uh, sort of pick out. Another part of the problem with invisibility is destruction. Right? We have lost most of the really significant Native American sites in this part of the world. And one of the reasons for that is, despite all the cultural differences between Europeans and the native people, in some very important ways, good places to live are good places to live. It doesn't matter who you are. And the good places to live are places that are close to water, places where the terrain is level as opposed to steep, places where the underlying soil is well-drained so it doesn't turn to mud every time it rains. Those are the good places to live. And that's where the native people came over and over and over again. And one of the best places in New Hampshire would have been Amoskeg Falls in Manchester, an incredible fishing location right at the base of the falls. But the same waterfalls that made this attractive for Native people for 8,000 years made Manchester the center of the Industrial Revolution. And if you look at this aerial photo, it's, it's gone. Utter devastation. Okay, so the most important sites have been wiped out. Here's a quiz for you. Where are we? Anyone recognize this? Not far from here. Is that Peterborough? That is Peterborough. Excellent. Okay. An aerial view of Peterborough, New Hampshire. Okay. 
And uh, boy, it looks pretty built up. Okay? And I, I thought about this location during COVID, my wife and I would get takeout food and we'd sit in this little park and, and look at this location. It's right on the Kantukuk River at its confluence with the Nubanusit Brook, the kind of place native people loved. And it has dry underlying sandy soil and it's pretty level. Uh, and every time I sat there, I said, boy, there had to have been a heck of a sight here, but look at it now. Okay, it's completely paved, destroyed. This is called Depot Square because in the 19th century, this is where the railroad depot was. It was a passenger station and a freight yard, and there's nothing left of the site that was here. And this is, this is before we even have archaeologists to look for this sort of thing. So we have lost a, a tremendous amount. Uh, here's a, a, a third example of this, the, the loss of, of local sites. I'm always looking, I'm always hoping to find some place that has somehow escaped all of this damage. It's very hard to do. And a few years ago, I went back and I was digging in the, the local histories, and they were talking about um, where they thought Indian villages were located. And so there's this one little passage talking about a village at the left bank of the Ashwillet River, just below the south line of Keene. This is, I think, less than a mile from where we are tonight. Uh, and so here's the Keene Swansea line, and the left bank would be here. And again, the perfect kind of place for native people. This is Ash Swamp, which drained a huge wetland coming right into the Ash Willett River. This is where I'd expect a site to be if the underlying soils were the right kind. So my next step was to look at the soils map okay, from the, uh, the USDA. And I'm looking at this, and, and you see these different zones. So here's, here's the confluence right here. And these soils here, 526B, Caesar Lomi Sand. This is, I, I swear, the official Native American soil of Cheshire County. Okay? <laughs> Every one of our sites is on this kind of soil. It's very fine, sandy, bone-dry, glacial, outwash soil. Great place to camp. And so if you were going to be in this vicinity, that's where you'd want to be. You would not want to be on the other side of the stream with this soil, the rain and wear em soil, because that's a flood soil that's wet most of the time. So if I were looking for a village, I'd be right here. But if you notice, okay, we have the Caesar soil here and here, and in the middle of it, we have two... 98, which is pits, gravel. Uh, and as I saw that, my heart sunk. Uh, I said, what has happened to this place? And I went out and looked at it, and I looked at some old aerial photos, and there it is in 2008. Okay? This soil is valuable if you're in the construction trade. And so some enterprising person opened up a sand and gravel pit and that was where the site was, loaded into dump trucks and taken God knows where. Uh, so again, we've lost a, a tremendous amount of uh, what was here. Now, despite that, and I start off on sort of a sad note, um, despite that, there are still very significant sites in this area, uh, places that have not only told us about the human history in the Monadnock region, but have been significant to archaeologists all over northeastern North America and very significant to the native people. The uh, one that I uh, am particularly fond of, and uh, at, at this point in things, I, I sort of think, boy, unless I'm really lucky, this is going to be, for me, the site of a lifetime. And I know it's one a number of you have, have heard about. I was uh, hired to do an archaeological study before the construction of the Keene Middle School, uh, which is northwest of the city center. And you can see where the campus is, right uh, bounded by Route 12, Maple Avenue, with a huge area of wetlands to the south. And before they built this, they were required to do an archaeological study. And I was lucky enough to be hired to, to do it. Here it is on a topo map. You can see the level terrain, the old Daniels Elementary School right there, and, and Tenant Swamp. And what we found were four completely intact, undisturbed, oval-shaped clusters of artifacts that dated from the, what we call the Paleo-Indian period, the very first period of human occupation in this part of North America. And this is, this is maybe three miles from where we're sitting tonight, maybe a little less. And we have a very, very rich history here. Um, a remarkable site. I excavated it with a, 
the help of a tremendous team of people, um, including zooarchaeologist Tanya Largi, who analyzed our animal bones, Heather Rockwell, who looked for uh, traces of wear on stone tools to tell us what they've been used for, and two geologists, Steve Pollack, who's going to tell us where people were getting the stone for their tools from, uh, Chris Dorian, who is going to reconstruct the environment of Keene at the end of the Ice Age and tell us what that setting was like and how it had formed. Uh, we excavated the site as carefully as we could. No matter how skilled you are, when you dig a site, you destroy it. There is no putting it back. You've got one chance to record as much data as you can. And in archaeology, almost always the most important data is where things are. And so we made great efforts to do what my friend Ed has done here. To, he has just found a Paleo-Indian scraping tool, and, and he has uh, exposed it before it's removed from its original location. So we can map it in precisely to the centimeter, and it is going to be the maps that really tell the story of this site, because those four clusters turned out to be uh, uh, very distinctive things. So our geologists helped uh, the setting here, and all of you... Now, even if you're, if you're in your first year at Keene State, you know something about this area and something about what it looks like. New Hampshire is a pretty hilly place, and it's a pretty rocky place. And yet, here we are on this lovely campus that the Ashwillet River runs uh, right by it. And if you go from here over toward Walmart, and you look at that terrain, and if you look down at, at Swansea, one of the things that is, is striking is how flat so much of it is. It's, it's very unusual. And what our geomorphologists told us was how that came about. So if you go back 18,000 years ago, what we call the glacial maxima, everything is covered with ice, all of New England. So there's nothing here. But after 18,000 years ago, the climate begins to warm, the glacier begins to melt. And by 15,000 years BP, before present, uh, the glacier is gone and it has left behind huge lakes of meltwater. And there is one right where we are right now called Glacial Lake Ashwillet. It goes all the way from uh, uh, down in, in, in Winchester and Hinsdale all the way up to Marlow. And that lake sticks around for a little while, but then it begins to drain out. And this is where our flat terrain in this part of Keene and Swansea comes from. The, the, the waters of the lake deposit very, very fine sands in what's called a braided outwash plain. This is a picture of one from northern Greenland. This is what this spot looked like 14,000 years ago. And there are 70 meters, about 230 feet of this sand on top of the old glacial lake bed. And all of this is happening before people get here. Uh, so we have a nice flat surface. And the other thing that, that Chris identified was, you know, the climate has been getting warmer, okay, for thousands of years, and then all of a sudden, at about 13,200 years ago, it gets cold again, and it gets really cold. There's a dramatic climate reversal called the Younger Dryas, and to give you a sense of the conditions, the, the winter time in the Younger Dryas period in this part of the world, the estimates are the typical temperatures would be between 30 and 50 degrees below zero, with a 30 to 50 mile an hour wind coming out of the Northwest. Incredibly difficult circumstances. And the winds of the Younger Dryas picked up all this sand, blew it around in the air, and redeposited it in a layer that geologists call an aeolian mantle, a layer of windblown sand. And at our site, all of the artifacts are in that layer of soil, because this is when the first human beings come into this area. Um, so that is, that is our setting here. Uh, Chris also figured out that the Ashwillet River, when the Paleo-Indians were here, ran right up against that. It was not on the edge of a swamp, right? but they were living on riverfront property. So we got to completely excavate all four of these clusters, and so I'll just quickly uh, show you what they look like. And again, the important thing here are the maps. So we start digging these and we're chasing artifacts. We're excavating out and out until we stop finding things and we have each cluster. So here's our first one, our second one, our third one is up there. Fourth one is way up in the woods up, up uh, here somewhere. But the next thing I'm gonna show you is the map of the artifacts that we made from the excavation of this unit. So that's what it looked like when we were done. And that's what the map looked like. Okay, now on this map, uh, we have different symbols color, uh, for different kinds of stone tools. 
They're color-coded by the type of stone. We also have numbers that represent the chips of stone from tool making or pieces of burned animal bone. And when you're looking at this map, there's too much stuff. When I looked at it, I couldn't pick out any patterns. It was, it was too cluttered. And to sort of orient you here, each one of these is a meter square. So we have two meter squares right here. If you think about this as a jigsaw puzzle, this part here is going to fit in right here. Right? That's how it would work. So a whole bunch of stuff. But the thing that really uh, stuck out to me when I first looked at this map is if you were to draw a line around where the stuff is, you got a perfect oval, mm -hmm. okay? a perfect oval. That's interesting. The other interesting thing are these stones right here. And these are just ordinary small pieces of New Hampshire granite. They're, they're not tools. They haven't been in a fire. But they don't belong here. There's no natural stone in the soil. And they're more or less in a line that parallels the line of this oval. And that's going to be a key thing. So uh, we got all this in a computer. You tell the computer, I don't want to see everything. I just want to see. Show me where the burn bone is. And so here's our oval. And in each of these is a 50 centimeter uh, square, 29 pieces, 11 pieces, four pieces. The burn bone is very tightly concentrated right in the middle of the oval, just like the bullseye on a dartboard. So we not only have a non-random shape, but within the oval, we have some patterning as well. And those are those uh, uh, unusual rocks right there. Um, this is what they look like. And we had not found any stones, so we paid very close attention to these, uh, excavated them carefully, photographed them, and mapped them. You can see them forming a line. And when we were done, uh, very carefully removed them, excavated the soil underneath them, and found a beautiful Paleo-Indian scraping tool. So whatever these stones are, they are definitely part of uh, this occupation. And they're going to be really key to interpreting the site. Here's Locust 2. Hey, working around the roots of a, a giant pine tree. And there's the map for Locust 2. And this is a big one. This had the, the uh, highest number of artifacts and was the, the biggest in size. And once again, you can draw an oval around where the artifacts are, and pretty much everything is confined a little bit outside. And, and that turned out to be interesting. I'll come back to that in, in just a second. So um, clean it up. And here's where the burned bone is. 11 pieces, 13 pieces, 9 pieces, 16, dead center, middle of the oval, just like the bullseye. Okay, so the same thing we had with the first one. And one of the bones was identified as caribou. In fact, we have four caribou bones. They were, they were an abundant game animal for the Paleo-Indians. Uh, interestingly, all of them are foot bones, and three of the four are from juvenile animals. So make of that what you will. Um, now, what, what is up with the, the ovals? And the interpretation was actually pretty straightforward because we'd seen some of these in other parts of North America and even a couple cases up in Maine. We would have been looking at something like this. Right, these, this is a photograph of Inuit people um, from uh, northern Quebec about 100 years ago. And if you were to walk into their tent, which is made of caribou hides, you would find a small fireplace in the middle a work area around it, okay, and a sleeping area right on the edge. So what we have in Keene are four houses from the end of the Ice Age. Okay. With everything happening indoors, we didn't find anything outside of these ovals suggesting that it's a wintertime occupation, that people are hunkering down in these tents trying to survive the brutal conditions of the Younger Dryas period. Um, so. Our walls would mark the edge of the tent. The sleeping area would be there. So you can picture people uh, sleeping. So we basically have the entire blueprint, the floor plan of a house from the Paleo-Indian period. And we've got four of them. That's why this is such an exciting site to uh, people in my discipline. Now, it got better. A lot of times when you're working on a site like this, your most exciting finds come when you're done. And one of the exciting finds here was our radiocarbon date. We were able to get a date from some of the burned bone in house number two. And when we got the results back, okay, again with BP meaning years before present, there is the date, 12,570 to 12,660 years before present. 
There is no older dated site anywhere in New England. This is as old as we have found so far, and it's, it's right here. So the human history is, is long and deep. Uh, we had 216 stone tools, and our expert uh, analyzed them all. She found evidence of scraping tools. Okay, with uh, these, we had dozens of these. This was a major activity. They would have been in a wooden handle. These are museum replicas, uh, but the wooden handle is decayed, and we're just left with the, the end part. So what are people doing in these tents, trying to survive this brutal winter in this brand new place they're in? They're getting ready for spring. Okay? They're making their clothes, getting their toolkits together. Uh, we had other scraping tools with more microscopic evidence of hide scraping and wood scraping. Uh, uh, we had these graving tools, and we archaeologists have wondered for decades what these are. We've come up with theories ranging from engraving to making clothes to tattooing. Uh, and unfortunately, when, when uh, our expert Heather Rockwell looked at these, she couldn't see anywhere at all. These little sharp stylus tips that were the working part, whatever they were used for is so delicate, uh, it didn't leave any traces she could see. We had cutting tools right, made of... Uh, <coughs> Uh, flakes left over from tool making that also had occasionally evidence of hide scraping and a few of them had evidence of prehension, the technical term for being grasped in a human hand. In other words, these cutting tools were held so tightly and for so long by whoever made them that 12,600 years later my colleague could still see the polish from that person's hand, which is uh, to me a, a very exciting find, a, a real sort of human connection. We had woodworking tools, spoke shaves, used to make things like knife handles or maybe even spear shafts. Uh, and the hallmark of the Paleo-Indian period, the fluted point, which is made and used all across North America, was elusive at this site. This is a beautiful example of one made of, of chert from northern Maine, but we didn't find it in Keene. I'm just showing it to you so you know what one looks like. We worked for almost a month on this site before we found our first glimmer of, of evidence for hunting, and it was this tiny little fragment. This is a one centimeter scale, this, this corner or ear from a fluted point. And that was the only hunting weapon we had until the very end of the excavation when we did find the broken base of a fluted point, and it was right outside of the oval of house number two. Right. Um, now, the stone itself, where did it come from? And what this gives you is a sense that these Stone Age people living in this incredibly difficult environment actually were not isolated and primitive. They lived in a very large and very complex world. The, all of the stone tools from this site are coming from either Jefferson, New Hampshire, north of the White Mountains, Berlin, New Hampshire. Half of the tools we have here in Keene came from a single quarry in Berlin, the Mount Jasper Quarry which is a cave at the top of the mountain, and the native people took so many tons of fine-grained volcanic stone out of it that they created this cave. This is a human-made cave that you can walk into and walk out of, and it's on the backside of Mount Washington, and somehow it all got down here. And all the rest of our stone is coming from north-central Maine. And I think what this tells you is that as part of their survival, these people were parts of extensive networks of related people that moved information and shared valuable materials all across this area. A network so big that some of this stone from up in Maine during this time period is found as far south as New Jersey. Uh, this is a big world that these people lived in. Here's sort of a graphic showing you the, the houses. And we don't know if they were all occupied during the same winter, but we have three of them here and the fourth one uh, sort of isolated up there. There may have been others that we missed. I'm not saying this is all. Our initial testing was at an eight-meter interval, so we could have missed quite a bit in that. So, an exciting early history. But that history continues. So let's go from northwest of Keene. Let's go down the road a couple miles south to, we'll cross the Swansea line and wind up at Sawyer's Crossing. Okay, so here's uh, uh, Matthews Road coming down here. Here is the Sawyer's Crossing Covered Bridge. It's an area with a remarkable Native American history. In the 1970s, my late friend and colleague Art Whipple found another Paleo-Indian site, the one of only two in Cheshire County, up on this high bluff overlooking the, the river. It was excavated by the University of Massachusetts, became one of the best-known Paleo-Indian sites in 
Eastern North America. Those town histories that at the beginning said there were no significant Indian presences here, these town histories also tell you later on that Sawyer's Crossing is where kids used to go in the 19th century to collect arrowheads, which they do by, by following their fathers as they plowed the fields and picking the arrowheads out of the furrows. And the local museum in Swansea has a nice collection of these, and the styles span 9,000 years. And the same histories say that as recently as the 1880s, you could see the earthen wall of a fort built by the Abenaki during the French and Indian Wars in the mid-1700s. And so in a 10-minute walk, you can go from the end of the Ice Age through 10,000 years of time and wind up in the 18th century. And it's all right here. It's a continuous, complicated presence. And then in the river, uh, the thing I focus my attention on uh, the Swansea Fish Dam, a large V-shaped alignment of boulders in the Ashwillet River that was seen by the first Europeans here, and they called it the Old Indian Dam. And I was able to uh, study this with my students from Franklin Pierce over the course of 11 years. It's an important place. But here's another piece of evidence that tells you about how central that place was. And again, this is you know, just down the road from where we are. This is a map of Indian trails created in the 1960s by a historian named Chester Price. And when he put his map together, gleaning sources from every written history he could find, five different trails converge right at Sawyer's Crossing, telling you again this is a central place in, in native geography and, and had been for thousands of years. And also, if, if you look at this map, it's intriguing to, to study this, especially if you know this region. Because you look at it and you say, wait a second, I recognize some of these trails. Okay? That looks a heck of a lot like Route 12. <laughs> okay? It really does. Um, I live here in Dublin, and every time I go to Concord, I take this trail. I go through Antrim, Hillsborough, Henniker, Hopkinton. Now, I call the trail Route 9, but it's the same trail. Because when the Europeans came here, these trails existed. They were the best way to get from point A to point B. So they, they followed them. They widened them so their ox carts would fit on them. And in the 20th century, they began putting asphalt on them. So we are still very much on top of and using a native geography. There is the earliest photograph we have of the Swansea Fish Dam. When the first settlers came to Swansea, it was in plain sight. It was in a shallow, rocky, fast-moving part of the Ashwillet River. And you could see it plain as day, and everyone called it the Old Indian Dam. And the idea was that the, the point of the V is pointing downstream. And so migratory fish in the spring would be coming upriver. They would hit this barrier and be forced over to the shore where they could be netted or speared. That's the idea of how it might work. But then in the 1860s, they built a woolen mill downstream from it. And the woolen mill created an impoundment. It had its own dam. And it backed up the river so it went from being fast and, and rocky and shallow to being deep and muddy. And the old dam disappeared. And by the time you get to 1950, it was maybe only your great-grandparents who might be able to tell you, I remember when I was a kid, we used to be able to see the old Indian dam. It was fading from memory. But in 1950, they had to repair the woolen mill dam that caused it to disappear. And so they took it apart. The water level dropped back down. It was shallow and rocky again. And out of the mud like a phoenix comes the old Indian dam. And people were so excited, they got someone up in an airplane to take a picture of it. Okay? And there was a story in the Sentinel. And, and there you go. But the woolen mill dam was uh, repaired, and it disappeared again. This is what it looks like today. Because in 2006, the state of New Hampshire took out the woolen mill dam once and for all. And so now, if you know where to go, you can go there and, and see it. And working with my Franklin Pierce students, we were able to learn quite a bit about this dam. Uh, the fish in the Ashwillet River that would have been useful uh, were uh, members of the herring family, alewives, shad, blueback herring. And this photo here, when alewives are running upstream in the spring, this is what it's like. Okay? All of a sudden, there's more fish than water. I used to catch these when I was a kid in Connecticut, not with a hook and a line, but with a garbage can. <laughs> you just stand there in the stream and wait, and all of a sudden, boom, there you go, and you scoop. It's an incredible resource. Um, and then in the fall, uh, American eels do the opposite thing. They go downstream and would have been caught 
right in the point of that dam. We're able to make a very nice map of it. Huh? And it looks something like that, a little bit more of a check mark than a V. But you can again see how fish coming up river are going to hit this barrier, be forced right over to this channel. So it's a really handy way of harvesting a lot of high quality food in a very short period of time. But we had to somehow prove that the dam was actually made by Native Americans. You can't date the stones themselves. You can't radiocarbon date stone. So to do this, working with my, my Franklin Pierce students, my idea was that, you know, if that dam was the focus of people's activity, if we could test, dig small test pits up and down both banks of the river, the closer we got to the dam, the more artifacts we should find if that was the focus of what we were doing. So we started this work digging these 50 centimeter test pits, screening our soil through quarter inch mesh screen, worked on this site intermittently for 11 years, moved a lot of dirt. Every one of these little black dots is one of our excavation units and absolutely settled the question of who built this dam. Sure enough, the closer you got to it, the more artifacts you found. And we had a whole variety of things. These uh, points, actually a little bit north of the dam, not next to it, so I, I wouldn't use them to date the dam. But I show them to you because they're upwards of 8,000 years old, another point in time that people are here. Uh, a broken stone gouge probably used for making dugout canoes right next to the dam. Beautifully decorated pottery from right about the time of European contact, right next to the dam. And these stone tools whose styles date between two and 4,000 years ago, found right next to the dam. The oldest are these on the bottom. They're called Atlantic points. They were only made for a few centuries, between about uh, uh, 3,600 and, and maybe 4,000 years ago. And there has long been a theory that these are not actually spear points, but they're knives used to process fish and we had them right next to the dam. We also had the remains of fireplaces, because if you're catching this much fish, you have to smoke and dry them so they'll last. And we have tightly packed areas of burned rock, reddened and cracked, with pieces of wood charcoal in them that we could get radiocarbon dates from. So we have two dates, 34, 3,440 plus or minus 80 years before present, 3,600 plus or minus 80 years before present, basically the same dates as the oldest of those tools. So it's telling us that this site was first constructed and used almost 4,000 years ago and was still being used when Europeans got here. There's a, a very long history here. Now, um, a lot of people, if they're thinking about this at all, tend to draw a line uh, between all of the things I've been talking about and what happens when the Europeans come here. Um, that is an interesting story, and it is a hard story. It doesn't begin that way. The first recorded contact we have in New England between a European and Native Americans is Giovanni de Verrazzano, 1524, almost a century before the Mayflower, sails into Narragansett Bay and has a wonderful interaction with the native people there. Describes them as beautiful and having the most civil customs. Talking about the fact that they vary in terms of their physical appearance, their skin color varies. Um, it, it, it's a very nice, you know, their manner is sweet and gentle. What a wonderful place to start. But it goes downhill very quickly after that. Subsequent voyages do things like kidnap Indian people to bring them back to Europe and there's increasing hostility and tension. And we come up to the uh, 17th century and a little bit before the Mayflower, one of the, the, the key events, and I think it's a key event in American history, not just Native American history, uh, but an absolutely key event is a pandemic. Some disease of European origin that comes over and sweeps through the native communities from southern New England all the way up through New Hampshire and all the way up into Maine, and the estimates are it kills 90 to 95 percent of everyone okay, three years before the Mayflower arrives. And it's devastating if you can imagine the trauma that that inflicts on, on any human community. And then the Mayflower comes and the English begin to settle, and they, they hear about this pandemic, and they can see what it has done. They, they find uh, villages where there are wigwams surrounded by skeletons because nobody was left to bury the dead. And they see that as a mark of God's favor in the Puritan minister Cotton Mather. You can read it. The woods were almost cleared of those pernicious creatures to make room for a better growth. 
okay, in very, very dark language that, that anticipates some of the, the later horrors of the 20th century. It's a, a tough history. We see some glimmers of this in the archaeology. We see native people trading with Europeans. The, the native people here were not passive victims, and it took me a long time to stop thinking that way. It was actually a native colleague of mine who, who sort of forced me into that. They were not just hapless victims of all of this. They were participants. They were players in this business. They started trading with the Europeans. They started using muskets. They were key players in an international trade in animal furs. They had their own ambitions. Uh, it is, uh, and you can see the glimmers of this in things like arrowheads made of brass or copper. Uh, um, and they were made because this is you know, a European material, but they're also made in exactly the same shape they were making them out of stone before European contact. So it's not an abandonment of all native traditions, it's an adapting, okay? turning European things into native things. It's a very interesting process. And they're here in this area. The first Europeans saw them and talked about them. Uh, there is a pair, this is just one of them, a pair of uh, dugout canoes found at the bottom of Laurel Lake and Fitzwilliam in the 1960s. And they were taken out and, well, what do you do with two dugout canoes that you've just found? We'll bring them to Franklin Pierce, okay? And there they have sat in our hallway uh, ever since. And uh, a few years ago, I decided, because they looked like Native Americans, made them. But the only way to tell for sure was to get a carbon date. And so we took a sample from one of the canoes, and the carbon date told us in all these numbers over here, there is an 80% chance that that canoe uh, dates between 1516 and 1674, which in this area means it's native. Okay? And that's right here. Uh, it's a couple towns south of Keene. It's a difficult history, uh, and we're arguing about it still today. Uh, as, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, our governor uh, recently issued a proclamation that towns would not be allowed to replace Columbus Day with Indigenous Peoples Day. Uh, we're still fighting about this history and how to interpret it. It's a difficult history. Uh, a statue of Hannah Dustin, a, a hero from the uh, colonial period, a woman living in Haverhill, Massachusetts, whose community was attacked by uh, the Abenaki, who were allied with the French during the French and Indian Wars. And in the attack, her child was killed, but she's famous because she escapes from her captors and in the process of escaping, takes a hatchet and kills them all and then scalps them. Why did she scalp them? And this is a statue of her in Bosquin holding a handful of bloody scalps. And the reason she did that was because she could bring them back down river and get paid for them. Uh, there was a standing scalp bounty uh, issued by the colonies on the scalps of native people. You go up to Plymouth and there's an official New Hampshire state marker telling you the Baker River is named after Lieutenant Thomas Baker whose claim to fame is that he killed a whole community of Indians in Plymouth and was rewarded with a scalp bounty. Uh, what do we call it when you systematically use public funds to pay people to kill other people? Uh, and it was not just a matter of warfare. Um, my, my best source on this is this uh, uh, doctoral dissertation by, by Margaret Ball. And just picking out a few things from New Hampshire, you can see in 1703, 40 pounds for the scalp of an Indian over 10 years old. And Indians younger than that could be sold as prisoners. And you get to keep the proceeds. And by the next year, it would have gone up to 100 pounds per scalp. And you could still sell the children. And then in, in July 5th, 1755, 250 pound scalp bounty on native scalps. Now, put that in perspective. What was a pound worth back then? And so I, I dug around a little bit. And just to give you a sense of it, in 1761, a few years after this, the town of Peterborough voted 68 pounds to repair the meeting house and buy the land that it stood on. All right. 250 pounds is an enormous amount of money. There's a real incentive here to kill these people. In 1764, the expenses for the first public school in Keene, six pounds. All right. But by 1775, it had gone up to 60 pounds all right, for all the schools in Keene. This is a lot of money. If there are any public school teachers here, you're probably thinking it hasn't changed much since then. Um, this, is, this is a tough history. 
Okay, it really is. Now, the Abenaki survived this somehow. And we see them sort of disappear from history. They're written out of history. They're also hiding their identity. But they sort of come back in, and much of their survival is tied to basket making. By the 19th century, the Abenaki are surviving by making beautiful ash splint baskets and selling them first to farmers and then later to tourists and making them in these wonderfully elaborate forms. These are called fancy baskets. And uh, these days, you often find these in fine art museums. And you can see, if you look in the Monadnock region, if you look hard enough, you can see that they're still here. So uh, a colleague of mine just a couple of months ago found this, passed it on to me. This is from Peterborough from 1923, but they're interviewing an elderly woman, and she's saying, I left Peterborough in 1861, but as a child, okay, one of my earliest recollections is the Indians from New northern New York, possibly from Canada, used to camp in Putnam Grove selling baskets. Putnam Grove is, right, is in downtown Peterborough, right across from Harlow's. It's right in that area I showed you. And in 1861, there are Indians here selling baskets. They haven't gone away. Um, here's a photograph from uh, the early 20th century from the Eastern States Packing Company in Peterborough. Peterborough, as did Keene, had a big basket making industry. And there's a photograph of a native man making baskets in Peterborough. And one of the best known stories from right here in Keene is of the Sedekis family. Israel and Mary Sedekis were uh, Abenaki people who lived in the Abenaki village up in Odenak in Quebec. And in the 1880s, they decided to move. Times were tough. They wanted a, a better place to live. They got in a canoe, came down the Connecticut River, and wound up in, of all places, Keene, New Hampshire, where they did very well. Israel started a business. Look what he's doing. He's a basket maker. Uh, this, this is what Abenaki people do to survive. This is his ad from the business directory. Uh, here's a, a photo of, of his granddaughter holding a picture of Israel's wife, Mary Watso Sedekis. They were very popular here in Keene. They were known as Keene's Indians, and they were well-liked and well-respected. Israel was, among other things, a deacon of the Episcopal Church. And so you look at that and you think, this is, this is good. Finally, the Abenaki can come back to where they're from. But the history is still tough. And I, I got a sense of this from an exhibit that uh, uh, my, my uh, friend and colleague, Lynn Murphy, who's one of the Sedekis granddaughters, did on her family. And in that exhibit was a photograph of her grandmother, Elizabeth Sedekis, next to her birth certificate, which is a remarkable document. And in a way, it's ordinary. State of New Hampshire birth certificate okay, um, from, uh, she was born in, in uh, 1897. But this is the funny thing about it. It identifies her father, Israel, born in Canada, and his color or race is Indian. That's what he was. Her mother, Mary Watso, born in Canada, her color or race is Indian, and at age 45, she has had the last of her 12 children. Okay? But here's Elizabeth, born May 16, 1897 in Keene. Her sex is female, and her color is white. How does that happen? Well, the family story is it's because they were so well-liked, the people at the hospital assumed they were doing them a favor by getting rid of their child's Indian identity. Uh, so it continues to be a tough history. I saw that, and I went down the rabbit hole called Ancestry.com. I wanted to see what else I could learn about the family. And the census records tell a very interesting story. The first record we have, because the 1891 is destroyed in the fire, is from 1900. And here is the family. And they're all identified in the column for color or race. They're all identified with the official abbreviation for Indian. It's what they were. There they are. Okay? In 1910, this is really interesting. Look what's happened here. They came, and for all the members of the family, they wrote in W for white. And then it's been crossed out. And they squeezed in the abbreviation for Indian. How does that happen? I mean, I don't know. I can imagine. In my imagining, I'd never be able to prove it, but in my imagining, the census takers doing their work in the parlor or on the porch, and someone from the family looks over their shoulder and says, no, hey, you've got to change that. That's not who, that, who we are. And so it's changed. And you go up to 1920, Israel Sr. has died. There's his widow Mary with a, a couple of her children and a granddaughter. And in 1920, they're all identified as white. 
Now the final census I looked at for the family was from 1930, and it was the family of this gentleman here, Israel Sedekis Jr. And this was a remarkable document, because on this document, uh, instead of official U.S. census abbreviations, look what somebody has written. Full blood Abenaki. Okay? No doubt about it. And again, I, I, how could that have come about unless Israel said, this is what you're going to write because this is who I am. Uh, it was important to him. And in spite of that, seven years later, he dies of bronchial pneumonia. He's buried in the family plot in the Episcopal Cemetery in Keene. And on his death certificate, he's identified as white. Right? So it is still a struggle to be seen and to be accepted as a native person in Keene. And that continues to this day. Uh, it's a, a tough history. Uh, to, to wrap this up, okay, just a, a one or two more slides. The archaeology, I think, is important. It can contribute to writing a more accurate history, one that doesn't say there were a few Indians here, one that doesn't call them lazy, but shows the depth and the complexity of this history and gets us a little closer to the truth. And that's one of the things, with the help of a lot of people, I've been very uh, privileged to do. Um, when the middle school was built, I, they have invited me every single year to come and give a talk to uh, the sixth graders, and the teachers raise money to build an interpretive boardwalk that includes a sign on the native people so that every single kid who goes to that school will learn about the real depth of human history here. And uh, uh, my colleague Miranda Nelkin, who did these wonderful illustrations, also took the lead in getting a grant from the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation um, to create a series of educational posters on local Abenaki history and archaeology. We worked with Abenaki consultants. We produced a set of five posters, and the Charitable Foundation paid to have them put in every school in the region. And so this is, this is a good use of archaeology to begin to uh, turn some of this history back. It's an interesting story, and a tough story, and one that's, that's still being written. So. Um, I, I look forward to continuing to work on this. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Now we might have a we might have time for a few questions. I'll let my say, moderator here. Yeah, I think we have a few minutes left. So if anyone does have a question, I can bring a mic to you. And just for the purpose of accessibility for everybody in the room, if you can use the mic, that would be great. Um, does anyone have a question that they would like to ask Bob or what's on your mind? Uh, my name's Jackson and I'm just curious, how are you able to like identify how old the bones are? Good question. Uh, the, with the bones, we used radiocarbon dating since they come from something that was at some point alive. Uh, a radiocarbon lab can measure how much of the carbon-14 has decayed and get an estimate from that. Um, with some of the stone tools where I talk about how old they were, that's because we have found those particular styles on sites that we have also radiocarbon dated things like, you know, burned wood from fires, and if a certain style of tool is right around them, we know the age of the tool. So we've worked out a pretty good chronology of, of what these things look like. Oh, great question. Other questions? There was another hand up that I missed. All the way yeah. <laughs> I'm Sally, and I'm curious about how how the information that you have gathered with students and other scholars is shared with Abenaki. Yeah, good question. How is this information uh, shared with the the Abenaki? Uh, um, I I work with some Abenaki people. Right. The Abenaki political landscape right now, and actually for a long time, is fragmented and politically very tricky. Um, I don't work with everybody. I, I do work with some people. Um, I make my publications accessible to everybody. And mostly what I do to, to share it with my Abenaki colleagues is I wait for them to tell me what they want. Uh, if they want to know about a particular thing, if they want me to come and speak to their uh, community. So rather than thinking, okay, I, I know what you need, here it is, coming from the, the white expert, okay, um, I, let, I let them take point on it. 
And so I have, I have had the honor of being invited to a number of gatherings and uh, uh, presenting this. And the Abenaki are, uh, they, they think this is very significant. This is their history. Uh, and, and when my Abenaki colleagues hear me talk about the site in Keene that's 12,600 years old, they say at, very adamantly, those are our ancestors. Okay? We know those are our ancestors. And you know, as an archaeologist, I, I can't prove or disprove that, but I can tell you that there is no evidence that this region was ever abandoned in all that time, and there is no evidence of someone coming from outside and pushing the native people out until the Europeans arrive. So they, I think, could very well be right. Oh, good question. Hi, thank you. I would like to go and honor the fish dam. Is there a map available on the internet? Yeah, there is, is there a map to go to the fish dam? There is not. Uh, and one of the, the delicate balancing acts we have here is it's really important to share this information like, like I've done today. But we still have a problem with people looting archaeological sites, going and doing unauthorized digging to find artifacts and you know, sell them on eBay or whatever that sort of thing is. So we have, we have not marked out these sites uh, very intentionally. With, you know, with the fish dam, if, if I were to describe where to go, Okay, and for someone of goodwill, I'd be happy to do that. Um, I could tell you how to get there. It would be about a 10-minute walk, and, and you could see it. But I would never put it in a, in a public location because of that problem. Thank so, you. Yes, good question. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm Judy Reed. Um, I, I understand that the, that the Native people from this area, well, all of them from everywhere in the mm -hmm. Americas, um, we're farmers as well, and I and I wonder if if there, I mean obviously it would be really difficult to have to have uh, evidence of that, but I, I think that there were farms when when they first went. Yeah. Good good question. What what about farming? What about agriculture? What we know because we get these descriptions when the English came here, they saw the native people farming corn, beans, and squash. They were really interested in that because they were coming from an agrarian society. They wanted to know what grew here. So they wrote extensively about it. And I think in doing so, sort of exaggerated the importance of it. What the archaeology tells us is that those three crops, the three sisters, corn, beans, and squash, that are domesticated in, the, in Mesoamerica and then spread gradually through North America, they don't arrive in New England until about 800 AD. So it is very late in this story that they show up here. And when they do, instead of producing an agricultural revolution, it's very interesting. What happens is that the native women, who are the traditional plant gatherers and botanists, they just begin growing small patches of these. And it's a supplement to the traditional diet of hunting and fishing and gathering that has worked so well for 12,000 years. So it, it is here, but I, I don't think it became the center, and I, I would not describe them as farmers if I had to come up with a, a one-word definition for their economy. Kitchen gardens. Kitchen gardens, there you go, I, I like that one. Now, an exception to that would be tobacco. Okay, we know that the use of tobacco in, in New England goes back at least 3,000 years. Uh, and so there, there was cultivation of that, but in terms of food crops, yeah. Yeah, thank you. All right, we'll take one last question and then we'll start to wrap up and there will be a little bit more informal time maybe. If I'll, I'll hang around as long as people okay. would, yeah, would yeah. like me to. Take this as our last official question. Uh, hi, my name is Peter and I was wondering, um, were there not a lot of boulders and granite around here to make tools from back then? Were, was, were the glaciers, like the topography, was it different? Yeah, good, good question. What about the stone for, for making tools? There were, there were plenty of boulders, okay? Have, have been since the, the, the glaciers retreated. We have no shortage of boulders. Um, the tricky thing with making most of the stone tools that native people were making, you need to have very fine-grained homogeneous material, what, what geologists call crypto-crystalline stone, where the, the, the structure is so fine you can't actually make out individual crystals. That way you can predictably shape the stone. 
that's the stone there is not much of in this region. And so they had to go some distance or have connections in other areas. So at the, the Swansea Fish Dam, um, you know, we saw stone there coming from the Hudson River Valley. Uh, you know, in Keene, it's coming from, from northern Maine. Um, but that was an issue. And, and they had social networks that would solve that for them. So, yeah, good question. The granite itself, you, you cannot make those kinds of stone tools out of granite. It's, it's too coarse grained. Yeah. Really wonderful questions from our audience. And Bob, you got through so many questions so quickly. So thank you. You're like <laughs> and I got through my talk, too. I had real <laughs> doubts about that. So, yeah. It's yep. wonderful. So I'm just going to kind of bring us to a formal close yep. together and with a couple reminders. And then Bob said he's happy to linger a little bit if you'd like to chat with him some more. Um, so just a reminder that we have some other excellent events coming up this semester. If folks are interested, we have the Cohen Institute's annual Crystal Knocked Remembrance on November 4th this year, which is taking place at Keene High School. Um, and we also have another talk in our Forensics and Genocide series, which is taking place on December 5th. And that's with Keene State's own Chris Monahan, who's going to talk about his work in Hawaii and the landscape there. Um, so all of the information about those events is on our website if you're interested. Um, but I just wanted to end with a final note of gratitude to you, Professor Goodby, for being with us tonight for this incredible work that you've done with your students and with members of the Abenaki community as well. And we've all learned so much. So thank you for being here. And let's thank give you. Bob a final round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.